some writer. The story of E.B. White. Chapter 8. A pig shall be saved. Fred was not Andy and Catherine's first dog, nor their last, but he was the dog Andy wrote most about. There was plenty to say about Fred. Fred came from a pet store on Madison Ave. And there's a footnote there, so let's go see what it says. In no time at all, Fred's troubles cleared up and mine began, White wrote. <laughs> so the dog became trouble. Though Andy considered Fred at times vile, he could not imagine life without him. And there's another footnote, and he says, his activities and his characters constitute an almost uninterrupted annoyance to me. Life without him would be heaven, but I'm afraid it is not what I want. So even though his dog is annoying, he still loves him. One afternoon in Maine, Andy's pig failed to appear for supper. As Andy wrote, when a pig or a child refuses supper, a chill wave of fear runs through any household. As it became evident the pig was not well, Andy worried. The animals on the farm white were part of a natural rhythm. They were born, nursed, and fed, and they enjoyed peaceful surroundings, and then some swiftly died. Raising animals to be butchered sometimes bothered Andy. I do not like to betray a person or a creature, he said. After befriending his animals, this felt like double dealing. But like most who raise animals, he farmed for food. Still, even if the sick pig was meant for slaughter, he did not like seeing it suffer. And he called his neighbors for advice. He and Joel tried giving the pig castor oil, then an enema. As the pig worsened, Fred's spirits seemed to rise. And he says, Fred was the notorious ghoul. Eventually, a vet arrived and repeated what Dan Andy had done, but the pig's health declined. By now, the pig did not even have the strength to make a bed for himself. Andy went to tend the pig one last evening and saw with grief that the pig had died. Andy went to bed. He awoke the next morning. His handyman, Lenny, was there digging the grave. And here's a picture. I knelt, saw that he was dead, and left him there. His face had a mild look, expressive neither of deep peace nor of deep suffering, although I think he had suffered a great deal. Fred was supervising. Under a bleak gray sky, Lenny and Andy hauled the pig into the grave and filled it with dirt. Andy tied a rope to Fred, and they made their way back to the house, with Fred reluctantly bringing up the rear. And it says... Fred patrolled the brink in simple but impressive circles. Though death was part of life on the farm, the death of the pig unsettled Andy. He looked for redemption. He wanted to find some way to save a pig's life. When Fred died later that year at age 13, Andy buried him near the pig and decided to write a book about animals and about saving a pig's life. But by what miracle on a farm could a pig's life be saved? Andy began on the lookout for wonders. Um, it also says here that the grave in the woods is unmarked, but Fred can direct the mourner to it unerringly and with immense goodwill. So even though it's not marked where the grave is, the dog can always find it. And then here's a picture. Fred's grave is marked. Fred's grave is the only grave I visit with any regularity. I do not express grief when I am down there, but I do feel sadness at all last things. Sorrow, not at my dog's death, but at my own, which hasn't even occurred yet, but which saddens me to think about in such pleasant surroundings. So that's Maine. Now we know where we got the idea. Okay, Charlotte's Web. I had as much trouble getting off the ground as the Wright brothers. So the Wright brothers are the ones who invented the airplane and it took them a long time to get it right. They had a bunch of failures. One October evening, Andy watched a spider spin an egg sack and deposit her eggs. A few days later, he carefully detached the egg, put it in an old candy box with air holes and brought it with him back to New York. He left it on his dresser, and a few weeks later, he noticed hundreds of tiny spiders coming out of the air holes and stringing lines from the box to his mirror, his comb, his brush. An entomologist, that's a scientist who studies bugs, 
from the Museum of Natural History helped him identify the spider as a Marinia canabatia, a plain gray spider that prefers, prefers shady situations. And there's a picture of the little candy box he had them in. And there's a picture of the spider with a scientific name. And so Charlotte's um, daughter was named Marinia. And in barns in Northern England, its webs are sometimes very large. Later, back in Maine, as Andy was bringing a pail of slop to the barn, an idea struck him. He wanted to write a story about animals. He needed to save a pig's life. Could a spider save a pig? He wrote to his editor, Ursula, to ask if there had ever been a spider as a main character in children's book. Not as far as she knew, she said, or at least not since Miss Muffet. So Miss Muffet is from nursery rhyme. Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, which is a little chair, eating her curds and whey which is sort of like porridge. Along came a spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. So that's the only famous spider in a story she knew of. In October, 1949, he wrote his publisher, Cass Canfield. My next book is in sight. I look at it every day. I keep it in a cartoon. Oh, sorry. I keep it in a carton as you would a kitten and spent the year studying spiders. In this, he wrote, I found the key to the story. Andy would not make his heroine Charlotte A. Cavatica conform to his narrative. His story would have to adapt to how spiders behave. For example, Andy learned that male species of spiders dance. So in one draft, Charlotte tells Wilbur the pig that her husband was some dancer. When Fern listens as Charlotte tells the barn animals how her cousin cast a web that caught a fish, Andy was being true to spiders because in rare special cases, spiders have caught small birds and fish. And when Wilbur takes Charlotte's egg sac to the farm in his mouth, he make, it makes sense. A cactea egg sacs are waterproof. And here's where you see that he used all the parts of the spider. Those are accurate. Wish you could be here today to see my characters in the flesh. Had a lamb arrive yesterday morning at breakfast time, a boy. He's already out in the barnyard playing in a snowdrift. Two of my geese are nesting, one of them right in the sheep shed, one on top of manure pile. Charlotte's children are due shortly. It's quite a day here today. When Andy finished the story in 1951, he wrote to Ursula that a draft was complete, but he wasn't quite satisfied with it. So he had to set it aside to let it ripen. Months later, though the tale still featured the barn and its animals, Andy had added five more chapters to give Fern more importance in the story. And he kept struggling with the first line. He began, Charlotte was a gray spider who lived in the doorway of a barn. Then he tried, I shall speak first of Wilbur. Then. A barn can have a horse in it, and a barn can have a cow in it, and a barn can have hens scratching the chaff and swallows flying in and out the door. But if a barn hasn't got a pig, it's hardly worth talking about. After setting aside the story for a year, he tried. At midnight, John Arabel pulled his boots on, lit his lantern, and walked out to the hog house. Last, White cut right to the action and tried. Where's Papa going with that axe? And then shortening it to... Where's Papa going with that axe? Oh, where that hand axe? And then he took out hand axe and just wrote, where's Papa going with that axe? Which is the first line. And here's um, a rough draft of it. Here's another rough draft. This is when he started with, I shall first speak of Wilbur. And this is the long one. The barn should have, but without a pig. But he does a picture of Charlotte up there. So you can see, this is what writers talk about when they say they do drafts before they get to their final idea. And this is when he started with him putting on his boots and walking out. And where's Papa going with that axe? After revising for another year, Andy sent the final manuscript to Ursula. She loved it immediately and did not recommend changing a word. 
But after she saw a printer's proof, she wrote to Catherine urging the Whites to consider one important alteration, changing the title of the second to last chapter from The Death of Charlotte to Last Day, so as not to give away the ending. Garth Williams agreed to illustrate Charlotte's Web, describing the story as just perfect. And he wanted Charlotte's character to be both beguiling and a New Englander, precise and disciplined. Garth based Fern on his daughter, Fiona, but he struggled with drawing Charlotte. He tried putting a human face on Charlotte. That was not the look Andy was after. Andy then sent Garth two spider books for reference. Garth later described them as gruesome. This is a very funny picture in this book that I think Garth should see. It is A, the eyes and hair that are quite fetching. Plate, I show an orb, web covered with dew. So he's giving him examples, orb web covered with dew. And here are different pictures of spiders he saw. And here are some of the earlier drafts of Charlotte. And this is the final one as she appears in the book. So she's got a little bit of hair and you can see her eyes and a little bit of her mouth. Garth wrote, I struggled to invent a lovable spider face. Finally, I gave her a Mona Lisa face as she is after all the heroine of the story. So Mona Lisa is a famous painting that's in France in the Louvre Museum. And Mona Lisa has like a closed mouth smile and it's sort of mysterious. Many sketches later, Garth had her almost perfectly rendered when Andy added two eyes and three hairs to Garth's story. Now she was pretty and a New Englander. Charlotte's Web was finally released in 1952. So it was Andy's idea to add the eyes and the hair. Charlotte's Web, and here's a quote. Why did you do all this for me? Why did you do all this for me? I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all this trapping and eating flies, but helping you perhaps, by helping you perhaps, <clears throat> I was trying to lift up my life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. There's Wilbur. <clears throat> and then it's burn up on the Ferris wheel. In one review, the writer, Adora Weltley, described the story, What the book is about is friendship on earth, affection and protection, adventure and miracle, life and death, trust and treachery, pleasure and pain, and the passing of time. What it all proves is that human beings must always be on the watch for the coming of wonders. As a piece of work, is, as a piece of work it is just about perfect. So... Human beings must always be on the watch for the coming of wonders. So Andy was really good at that, E.B. White, going out and seeing the wonder in nature, the wonder in little things. Though Andy agreed to allow a movie to be made, he was skeptical that the magic of the story could be captured on film. That means he didn't really believe it. He wasn't really sure. He reminded the movie's editor that the film should be a paean to life, a hymn to the barn, an acceptance of dung. The barn is a community of rugged individualists, everybody mildly suspicious of everyone else, including me. He went to great lengths to ensure that the movie was as close to the book as possible, that Templeton starts as a rat and ends as a rat, and most important, that Charlotte dies. Because, you know, in some kids' movies, they, maybe they wouldn't want the character to die, but he insists she has to die. Charlotte's Web won a Newbery honor and remains one of the most beloved children's books of all time. When Andy recorded the audiobook for Charlotte's Web, it took him 17 takes to get through Last Day, the chapter in which Charlotte dies. It's ridiculous, he told the producer, a grown man reading a book that he wrote and being unable to read it aloud because of tears. I can never read that chapter without crying either. 
<clears throat> Just want to add that there is no symbolism in Charlotte's Web and there is no political meaning in the story. It is a straight report from the barn cellar, which I dearly love, having spent so many fine hours there, winter and summer, spring and fall, good times and bad times, with garrulous geese, the passage of swallows, the nearness of rats, and the sameness of sheep.